Hello, I'm Bianca Cotton, host of Behind the Confidence Smile, and I'm with special guest Katie Kanjimi today. Thank you for being here, Katie. Thank you for having me, Bianca. <laughs> of course. We are about to talk about becoming a foster mom. And what a journey I know it has been for you. So before becoming a foster mom, Katie, did you ever see yourself becoming a parent? I don't think it was ever a question. I always thought that that was the natural progression in my life. And that was probably because of the family that I grew up in, the grandmothers, the aunts, and um, of course my mom too, <laughs> naturally. Um, and the culture that we live in, um, mm -hmm. I just thought that that was my natural path and never, never questioned it. Did you have this thought from childhood or was it in teenagehood? Um, or young adulthood, he was like, yes, I'm going to be a mom. Again, I think it was something that was always within me. Mm. Um, I had lots and lots of cousins growing up, so I was a babysitter at a very <laughs> young age, and so I was really comfortable, even just with little ones. But it wasn't ever, it wasn't ever a decision. It was always just, this will be the next iteration of my life. So mm -hmm. it wasn't even, it was like the sky is blue. So what happened between, this is innate to me, I'm a natural mother, nurturer, I babysit, to now I am embarking upon being a foster parent. <laughs> There is a, a vast between. Right, of those right. Take two us through that journey. Points in life. I didn't ever set out to become a foster parent. Mm. That wasn't necessarily a branch on, on my path that I said, absolutely, that, that is something that I'm going to do. But what I did do somewhere between that innate feeling to becoming a foster parent, somewhere in my early 20s, I made a statement. Um, and I don't know where it came from. I wouldn't doubt that it had a hint of selfishness or, or vanity associated with it. <laughs> but I said that I didn't, it wasn't important, it wasn't necessary to have a child that looked like me. I didn't have to have a biological child. I always knew I wanted children. But I made that declaration very early on, again, not knowing necessarily what would come of it. Again, kind of laughing at my 20-year-old self of saying these bold things that you don't necessarily know what they mean. <laughs> right. But perhaps there was some wisdom behind that, mm -hmm. that maybe I did know that that was something that would happen for me. Wow. But I think between that innate feeling and then this declaration in my 20s, um, it was, you know, about a decade later that I found myself as a foster parent. In your 20s, with making such a bold declaration, <laughs> like, right. that, like, this child does not have to be born for me. Do you think that was because of, oh, maybe I'm not in a serious relationship right now to, ha to have a child in that way? Or maybe I want to just try to create my family in another way? Mid-20s into late 20s, um, there were a lot, many women around me who were beginning their families. Mm -hmm. And perhaps I saw some things of pregnancy <laughs> that I wouldn't mind not having to deal with. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> but also saw that it was a beautiful process, too. Mm -hmm. um, and watching my friends... Um, get to know their babies in the womb was also really mm -hmm. beautiful. So it wasn't as though I objected to that. I think there was just something a stirring within me wow. that said that that is one way. Um, and then there are all these other ways too. And mm -hmm. uh, family can come in many different forms. I also think that I probably at that point in my life knew that it would be some time before I was ready. Mm -hmm. And um, so, again, just sort of keeping a sense of openness about it. Um, beyond that bold declaration, right. I didn't know. Um, but I think I just started to open that door. And perhaps that was, I'd like to think it was um, 
probably wisdom beyond me, mm -hmm. letting me know that a door had been opened that I would follow through later on in life. So let's fast forward, right? You said 10 years from that moment, mm -hmm. just about. Probably, yeah. <laughs> before, because we've had conversations offline before becoming a foster parent, you met Albert. So let's talk about how you met him before even being a part of his life yeah. and his village. Mm -hmm. I was in graduate school. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was like many graduate students. I had many jobs. <laughs> um, anything that I could do to help pay my rent while being in school. Um, mm -hmm. I was working um, as a researcher. Um, a dog walker, a nanny. <laughs> oh, you did it all. I was doing it, doing it all. Um, and uh, one of my friends was um, uh, working as a therapist in a group home. Mm -hmm. And not being from Chicago in the time that I had been here, it was learning through um, the nonprofit world. I um, was a, so I'm a sociologist um, by training, and I was learning um, about neighborhoods in Chicago and all of that through nonprofits. Um, and it was a really, really great way to get to know the city, not having been from here. Mm. And my friend was working at a group home. Um, I did have background in more therapeutic settings and I kind of missed that, mm. um, especially studying the world through a sociological lens. Yes. Uh, she said, why, you know, they have an opening for a part-time mental health professional. Would you be interested? And again, because I was at a point in my um, burgeoning career that I um, was open to seeing in what ways um, sociology and social work, applied sociology, would um, mm. evolve for me. And uh, so I applied as a mental health professional at a residential home for children, and I got the job. So you are embarking on a new career mm -hmm. <laughs> um, while hustling your other jobs <laughs> yes. in school, mm -hmm. and you become a mental health professional at a group home. What happens next? For the first several months, you have your training period and mm -hmm. um, probationary period, and um, after that time, uh, my supervisor said to me, Katie, I think you're ready mm. to have a primary. Now, a primary for people who haven't worked in residential or group home settings uh, is often a pairing between staff and and child that you just spend a little more time with. Um, and you, you know, people know oh, that's my primary and um, you do homework, celebrate birthdays, uh, but it's a way... I think to help um, balance out some of the um, institutionalization that happens mm. when um, when when kids and young people are living in in residential facilities, and so my supervisor said, "I think you're ready," um, and we have a new kid coming tomorrow. Oh wow! And mm. here's his file, and he handed me uh, an abbreviated file. And at that, I remember the night specifically because I worked the 3 p.m. to 11 mm. shift and uh, all the kids had gone to bed on our unit and I read his file and I met Albert the next day. What was it like meeting Albert for the first time after reading, <laughs> after reading about his life? It was a really beautiful moment actually mm. before I met him. As I said, all the kids had gone to sleep that night, and where I worked, there was a long hallway um, off of the living room and, and rec area where all the bedrooms were, and all the kids had their own bedrooms. Their doors were kept open, and um, there was a hallway light on, and we would play soft music mm -hmm. at night. Um, many of the kids often had... Uh, nightmares. And, and the, the unit that I worked on, the ages was like nine to 13. Mm -hmm. So we would keep soft music on. And when the kids went to sleep, a staff person had to sit in the hallway. And on that particular night, I sat in the hallway and this just 
easy jazz music was playing. And we always decorated the doors when a new kid came Mm -hmm. to stay. And I had all the construction paper out and I was cutting out the letters, welcome Albert. And I just felt this wash of love come over me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what it was. I just knew that I already loved this child that I hadn't met yet. And it was a feeling that I I hadn't ever had before. And I didn't think too much about it, Bianca. It wasn't that I was like, oh, that was something. It was just a feeling that I reflected upon over the years as my relationship with Albert blossomed. Yeah. I re- then I, I would f- reflect back, that was, that was the beginning. Uh, so that was the night before. And then when I arrived to work the next day at three, Albert had already arrived and all the kids were in in their rooms during transition period. So they had come home from school and they had about 15 minutes just to kind of settle and get ready for snack and homework. And I was so excited because I knew Albert would be there. And I walked in and my supervisor was like, he's here, he's in his room. And so I, you know, skip down to his room pretty much and I open up the door and he was sitting on the floor and he was taking apart um his radio Mm. all these parts were on the floor (laughs) and I opened up the door hi Albert I'm Katie it's so nice to meet you and he he just turned around and he was like okay and um (laughs) I was like, so, you know, just asking him questions. I'm so excited. And he just turns back around and starts playing with his radio. And and I was like, okay. You know, in my head, I'm thinking this is going to be, it's going to take a little bit more than what I thought. And um, I was like, well, oh, okay. I will be out here and um, I will see you when you come out for snack. And, you know, not even talking <laughs> back to me. And as I walk out the door, he was like, hey, lady. I was like, <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> he was like, you got any batteries? And I was like, let me check. <laughs> um, and I just remember walking out and I was laughing because I was like, I am over the moon excited about him. And um, he has absolutely no use for me. <laughs> Um, and that was both funny, um, but an important lesson Mm -hmm. for me. What Albert shared with me later was how long it took him to trust me. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, I remember that day you walked in. He was like, you were so excited. (laughs) He was, he said, you just had all this energy. He was like, I wasn't even listening to what you were saying. He was like, you were talking so fast. And um, (laughs) he said, but you know, to me, um, you were just another adult. Mm -hmm. And specifically, you were just another white lady. Mm -hmm. And I had already seen that so many times in my life. And it took me a really long time to believe that you were anything different than what I had known. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. And how old was he at the time when you met him? 11. Right. That's a lot for an 11-year-old. So you came in with the excitement. I sure did. He's like, yeah. Mm." Yeah. (laughs) I'm leery because of my experiences and my history. Mm Mm-hmm. Tune in this Friday on Can TV Channel 19 at 7.30 p.m. for another episode of In My Own Words featuring my special guest, Chief of Staff to the co-CEO of Aerial Investments, Victoria Watkins. I remember <laughs> telling people when I was at the city, you know, oh, my God, this is a dream job I never dreamt. Mm-hmm. And now I feel like that's happening again. So without knowing that at the time, right, how did you cultivate a relationship with him? I just kept trying. I mean, anyone knows that, you know, kids can be slow to trust any adult. Mm -hmm. Uh, I already knew having, you know, been working there that um, the kids that came 
to that particular organization had been through a lot. And um, it wasn't uncommon Mm -hmm. for there to be um, a lack of trust. In fact, that was the smart thing to do, given Mm -hmm. what Mm -hmm. the kids had experienced. So none of that was a barrier for me. Again, there was something that sort of spoke to me the night before he arrived that was the wind at my back with him. And I just kept going. Um, (laughs) I just kept asking him, do you want to go take a walk? Do you want to, can I help you with your homework? I would get so many no's, but it just, that was just sort of the nature of of it all. Um, And he slowly but surely uh, would come around and, um, and that was fuel for me to, to keep, to keep doing what I was doing. So you're new in this role, you have a primary, you meet Albert, um, you continue to try to build a relationship with him. How long did you work with him? I worked with him for probably about, oh gosh, he Most of the kids would age out of that particular organization at 13 or 14. And that was true for Albert. Uh, He then went down, stepped down level in care and was ready for foster care. Mm. So I worked with him until he aged out of of the program um, and moved on to foster care. And at the time, I um, I had taken another position at another nonprofit. And so I was only volunteering. I would still go back and and volunteer on a regular basis. I would still go once a week. So the time that I was a staff person up until, you know, through my volunteer time there, um, until he then moved on to foster care, he was 13 when he left, Mm -hmm. left and went, went on to foster care. Interesting, right? Two to the three year relationship, Mm -hmm. but you continue to come back and volunteer. What made you come back? to volunteer after you were no longer an employee. I just loved it. And and I had formed uh, relationships with the kids that, that were on mm-hmm. our unit. And um, we saw many of them go on to foster care. Many of them would come back and visit, but it really was in many ways like a family. And though I made a professional decision to um, work at another nonprofit. Um, I I didn't want to just walk away, and um, so it, it it provided a space to be able to still be connected, yeah. and um, and also needing to make this professional decision um, right. that was also right for me. How did Albert feel about you coming back once a week, still volunteering? <laughs> He, uh, when I told the, the unit that I was leaving, um, that was hard and it made it easier to let them know I'll be, I'll still be back once a week. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was a, that was a buffer. When I came back in the volunteer capacity, I didn't, I, the, the the kids still knew me like they knew me as a staff person, but they also knew that I wasn't, um, you know, things like keeping them on task. Yeah, I, I was. Like, I'm just here to have fun with you right, and to right. check in with you. Exactly. The relationship has shifted. Exactly. And it really did kind of open that up. Mm. Um, and it was nice because it, I, I wasn't that staff person <laughs> staying on task and all of that, but it was, it was more conversations. And the days that I, I had a set day that I would come and, you know, when I walk in, the staff would be like, Albert's been waiting for you. He's been asking when you're going to get here. And I would always stop and see him first and just check in and see what was going on. When he aged out uh, and we knew that he was uh, ready to move on from residential to foster care, I said to him, um, hey, buddy, I know that Um, you have this new chapter in your life Mm -hmm. and I totally get it if you want to leave this whole place behind. Um, Mm -hmm. But if you want to stay in touch and 
you know, go out for pizza or a movie or something like that, kind of like big brothers, big sisters kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, reach out to me. Um, would love to stay in touch with you. But I left that up to him because what we did see was that when the kids moved on to different places, again, some of them would come back and some of them wouldn't. And I think that was just sort of the the nature of their own course and, and, right. and being able to make their own decisions for their lives, especially important because so many decisions had been made for them. So I really felt it was important to leave that mm -hmm. up to him. And uh, I didn't hear from him for probably about three weeks. And then <laughs> one day he called and said, hey, will you come pick me up and take me out for a pizza? And <laughs> it was a simple as that. So now you're out at Pisa and he's in the foster home. Mm -hmm. How was that foster home going for him at the time? At first, it went okay. The parent was a first-time foster parent. Mm. And having been a, a foster parent, I, I, I know it's challenging. Um, she had raised three boys um, of, of her own. And I suspect that perhaps the match was a little more complicated than what originally seemed like it would be a good fit. Mm -hmm. And I think that was because Albert had been through so many placements, too many. And I think that perhaps what wasn't clear um, was just for the foster mom, how a child may show up Mm -hmm. kind of the same way he responded to me of, hey, you're just another person. And I've seen a lot of you in my life. Just because you've opened your home doesn't mean I love you. Doesn't mean right. that you're my parent. Doesn't mean that I even feel grateful for being here. And I think that that was difficult for her. So their relationship at, at first was okay, pretty smooth. Mm -hmm. And then it started to to kind of break apart. What I will say is that it was a blessing that he found himself in her home because she was, um, she had a medical background. I think mm -hmm. she might've been a nurse and Albert was complaining about, uh, a bump on his elbow. Okay. And she was very much on top of his medical care, making sure that he was up to date with the dentist and all of those things. And within the five months of being placed there, Albert was diagnosed with cancer. Mm. But it was because of her attention to what was ailing him, I think is what ultimately saved him from succumbing to cancer because the kind of cancer that he had was often misdiagnosed. It was a soft tissue cancer, uh, synovial sarcoma, and it's often found um, in the joints in between bones, oh. um, often in the arms and legs, and more commonly in males, more so than females, mm -hmm. more commonly in adolescents than any other age, age group. So you can see how wow. bumps on the arms and legs can often just get mi misdiagnosed from being active mm -hmm. and playing sports and growing pains and all kinds of things, um, only to find out that there is, in fact, a serious health issue there. I just think about all the bumps and bruises that I've yeah. gotten over time. Um, it's like, God, it's just, just not right? Yeah. I'm, I'm so grateful that she was able to identify that or at least put him in a position to be cared for. I do. As we wrap up this conversation, which we will reconvene because there's so much more to unfold to your journey to becoming a foster mom, what is one piece of wisdom or advice you will give to your 20-something self <laughs> um, <laughs> when you had that feeling of, it's okay if I don't have kids naturally. Mm -hmm. Like, what would you say to her? I would thank her for placing that seed in my heart. 
it has blossomed in my life. And it has also been an experience that I've been able to share with other people, especially women, as they've gone along their journeys of starting a family, growing a family, um, imagining family for themselves. And um, it was it 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 was wisdom that I didn't know was absolutely right for me, but it has been um, a story that I have so happily shared with others um, because I do believe that's true. Family comes in so many different forms um, and it can happen all throughout the life course. Uh, we just have to be open and accepting of however it shows up. That's a beautiful closing. Katie, thank you. Thank you for opening up one page of your book <laughs> of life um, with us and Albert's life with us and your career journey, personal journey. Be back, you all, because the conversation will continue.